And welcome to this edition of The Public Square. I'm Wayne Shepard here with the team. It's going to be something a little different today, though. We have a very special guest joining us, a good friend of mine, Dave, uh, Sergei Rakuba of Mission Eurasia is going to be with us here just momentarily. We'll introduce Sergey, but thanks for making room for this conversation, Dave. Well, it's a delight and it's overdue, Wayne. We've needed to hear what's going on from the ground in Ukraine. We have been blessed over the last several years to have your work as a part of our prayers with Mission Eurasia. We have great respect for your guidance of their board. And uh, if I might say, even greater respect for Sergey's lifelong commitment to this and the history right. of Mission Eurasia. You all are wonderful partners in, in the Great Commission and you're wonderful partners in the Great Commandment that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So yeah. I know our listeners are going to be very interested to hear what's going on in Ukraine right now. So can we start somewhere around there? Sure. Let's start there. But I will say that our producers, Alan C. Duncan, who's part of the conversation here today, along with Rob Walgate, Melanie Elsie, and Jeff Sanders. And that was Dave Zanotti, of course. So, uh, Sergey Rakuba, let me say hello to you and thank you, brother, for joining us. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so great to hear um, you guys, you know, so wonderful to be on your show, you know, so that I always, always listen, you know, so when I have a chance, mm -hmm. you know, so and I appreciate very much your uh, such a wonderful uh, work you do, uh, uh, informing people, you know, and all those important events that are taking place from the Christian perspective. Uh, so uh, great to see y'all. Uh, you know, I'm trying to practice. You know, so. Sergey recently moved to uh, Franklin, Tennessee, so he's learning to speak so Southern here. <laughs> yeah, where we enjoy, but uh, uh, and uh, um, you know, it's a privilege to be on yeah. your show and just give you an overview, update Thank what's you. happening in Ukraine, what's happening there in ministry and so on. Sergey, we won't take time, but your personal story of uh, growing up in Ukraine and uh, your time spent in Moscow, you've spent time in the Soviet army as all citizens of the uh, of the Soviet Union did at that time, or young men. Uh, we won't take time to go into your, your long and wonderful personal story, but as president of Mission Eurasia, uh, which includes Ukraine, your homeland, but it includes all of the former Soviet Union countries. And great things are happening in all of those countries spiritually. But let's focus on Ukraine for a few minutes. We're going to talk about a uh, confusing issue. At least it's confusing in some people's minds about what's going on with the religious liberty in Ukraine. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But just bring us up to date in general on what's going on with the, the state of the war and with Mission Eurasia and what, what you all are doing. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. You know, so I'm in touch with our team, you know, so and all my, uh, you know, contacts through all our ministry and uh, uh, church uh, relationships all across Ukraine, basically almost on a daily basis. So I get the first hand report, you know, what's happening. When uh, I turn the TV, it happens more rare now, you know, so and trying to get the news, you know, what's happening, you know, in the world, but specifically because Ukraine is so dear and so close, uh, you know, to my heart. I don't see anything except, you know, we're talking about, you know, so the political implication, uh, you know, so the debate on Ukraine needs help or Ukraine doesn't need help. And but, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening on the ground, you know, you rarely can get a qualified update uh, now on the main news network. Works. But what's happening, you know, so this morning talking, you know, so that, uh, by the way, Easter, you know, will be celebrated in Ukraine a, a few weeks later in May, but still, you know, so that's, you know, in my heart, you know, so I see that uh, people are suffering and over the weekend, Russian troops are still pondering those uh, uh um, communities, you know, and cities. The major cities been shelled, and it's happening on a daily basis. They use more more powerful weapons and missiles now, like Kiev was uh, shelled, you know, so probably with the more powerful weapons that ever Putin used since the war launched, you know, over two years ago. Odessa, uh, uh, civilian people, innocent people continue dying. And it happens, you know, in all major cities. War does not stop for a minute. The only thing, you know, Ukrainians are in that fatigue and that's, you know, they got exhausted, you know, from this war emotionally. They got, you know, tired spiritually. And the, when they see the world, you know, kind of, uh, you know, stepping 
out of their uh, position, you know, in terms of Ukraine is help, so they get a little con- more concerned with that. So that's what's happening, Wayne. But the need is enormous, you know, more than ever been, you know, since the war started in terms of humanitarian need. But also Ukraine needs, uh, uh, you know, overall support, you know, military support. And without that, that Ukraine relies on, they cannot win this war. You know, their spirit, they're still fighting for their independence. They are a sovereignty, but they need support. Ukraine economically been uh, really devas- devastated, you know, since uh, the war started. That, that's what Putin does. Yeah. He continues targeting, you know, those the power greed, you know, so destroying economical, economical. Wears everyone down, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah, that's the strategy. Well, um, Mission Eurasia is first and foremost a, a spiritual ministry of the gospel, but you have stepped into the gap to provide incredible humanitarian aid during this wartime. That includes uh, food. I've, I've seen some of this myself as you took me on a trip to Ukraine after the war started. I saw the distribution of the, of the food that is so necessary and even more necessary now. Wood stoves, you've been manufacturing wood stoves and providing those stoves and wood to uh, churches and individuals so that uh, families can get together and neighborhoods can get together and have some heat to enjoy and some place to cook their food as well. So a lot's been going on. What would you say about the spiritual climate and determination of the Ukrainian people? Yeah, the Ukrainian people are still determined, Wayne, you know, so, and they will fight to the end, you know, so they will not be kind of of compromising because so much damage, so much destruction already done, so many lives are lost, you know, so, and Ukrainians cannot afford to see if somebody will push this into that, you know, it's enough, give up, you know, but, you know, so if Russia takes over the rest of Ukraine, that genocide, that those persecutions, you know, will happen all across the entire nation. So Ukrainians will not allow that to happen. Mm. In terms of spiritual climate, Wayne, you know, I have not seen such a dynamic church growth in the the midst of the war. Amid all that chaos, destruction, and so on, the church is doubling, tripling in its growth because, you know, the church's impact in the midst of the destruction on the communities uh, uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, so we work with, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of churches across the nation. Uh, Just as of today, you know, so there will be a report coming next week. So for two years, we were able to provide into the hands of church volunteers over 280,000 family food packages that were delivered and placed into the hands of displaced or refugee people over 2 million copies of scripture, you know, the wood burning stoves you mentioned, because of the harsh winter, you know, so that cold season in Ukraine, and I'm telling you, it gets sometimes cold, quite colder than here in Tennessee where I am now. (laughs) But, you know, people need support. They need to feed their families. They need to warm their uh, places. In most of the cases, those places are half destroyed. They're trying to repair, patch them. And uh, so over uh, 5,000 wood burning stoves since the war began, we were able to manufacture. But the key in this, you know, so we're providing this wood burning stoves uh, for families, for churches, but they were manufactured by the displaced people. So we are providing employment. Creating jobs. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, in, in, in the time of war. Well, Dave, I, I, I've never encountered such uh, suffering as, as I've seen in Ukraine. And yet at the same time, the, the spirit and resiliency of the Ukrainian people is something to behold. Uh, I, I, I don't hear them complain. They talk, they describe their stories and what they've been through, but they do so without I mean, I would be whining up and down the street if I had to go hunt for food every day, but they don't. Yeah. Well, my question, Sergey, is this. Uh, People, I think, instinctively want to know, what did Ukraine do wrong that got them into this annihilation conflict with Russia? It's crystal clear that Ukraine can't defeat Russia in Russia, and Ukraine didn't attack Russia. How did they get in this mess? 
Ooh, that's a big question, you know, so Dave. And I think the people outside of Ukraine or outside of the realm of that region uh, understand uh, or have a limited understanding, you know, I have to be uh, politically correct even saying that. Uh, you see, Russia, Ukraine, everybody says it was part of Russia. If you talk about centuries, sure, these two Slavic or two, uh, I mean, people, you know, so they're like cousins. But uh, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Ukraine went independent as all other 15 Soviet republics. And they wanted to rebuild their own lives, you know, so they were finally free of the Soviet atheistic communist regime, and they started rebuilding their lives. It happened to be, again, it's not just because I'm Ukrainian, you know, born, raised in Ukraine, but, you know, it was true that Ukraine uh, kind of was uh, was growing more, uh, a, a lot faster than any other former Soviet satellite state, you know, and just, again, growing into democracy, independence, in religious freedom and human rights. Even Ukraine, you know, became the outpost, if I can say for Ukraine became one of the largest sending missionaries countries country in Europe, you know, in just short 10, 15 years since Soviet Union collapsed. So the church was just shining in the in the in Ukraine. So the Putin, you know, regime, the former KGB agent who understood only power, control, imperial ambitions, he says we will rebuild the so I mean the not Soviet Empire, but the Russian Empire mm -hmm. now. And they adopted the religious ideology, which is connected to the Russian Orthodox Church, and thought, we will just take control over Ukraine again. We'll submit them again, because you know we cannot afford that they go so far independent. And that's what actually happened. And they were trying to justify it with all other things. <laughs> Denazify Ukraine. You are you know, living in another country. You cannot take care of your own people. You're trying to denazify, which is not even there, you know, so in Ukraine. So there are many other reasons like this, Dave. So it sounds like Ukraine was too successful for Putin. And that's where it all came down. Yeah. Yeah. Too independent, you know, too free. Uh, I've got to take a break. This is The Public Square. We're talking with Sergei Rakuba of Mission Eurasia. We'll talk about the state of religious liberty in Ukraine coming up on The Public Square. right back for more on the public square introducing the latest program from the public square kids on the square we at kids on the square are dedicated to helping teach the next generation through topics like bible stories scientific marvels and american history we want to equip parents with fun and free educational resources to share the truth with their children won't you join us new episodes are released monthly you can listen wherever podcasts are available and visit kidsonthesquare.com to find out more. Thank you and... Welcome to Kids on the Square! Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Back with you on the public square this week. Our guest is Sergei Rakuba, my friend who is president of Mission Eurasia. And uh, the public square has been so kind to Mission Eurasia uh, during the last couple of years, Dave. Thanks for the attention you've given to this, this organization, this ministry that is on the ground and I have such respect for. And as you've said, I serve on the board and I'm so privileged to do so. Uh, but there is a, a growing issue about religious liberty in Ukraine that we've invited Sergey here, and we'll have another guest join us in a few minutes to talk about. Wayne, I have to tell you that our team across the board, everyone in the studio, everyone on our trustees, everyone understands that what you all are doing with Mission Eurasia is genuine biblical mission and ministry in a place where we can't get to, you have gone to, you belong there, you're, you're on the ground, and we support you with our prayers. And our listeners have have supported you in the past financially, and we hope and pray they will continue mm -hmm. to do so, because you're doing the right stuff. Uh, in your and, and now in that context, there's a smear campaign we're picking up, that somehow 
uh, across the conservative circles in America that there's a rap on Ukraine that they're somehow trying to take away religious liberty. Can we deal with that right now? What's going on, Sergey? Uh, you know, it's a tough question, you know, so Dave, but it's so necessary, you know, so to inform our brothers and sisters across their political preferences about what's actually happening on the ground in the realm of that issue. So Ukraine has two Orthodox churches. Actually, there are a few other affiliations, independent Orthodox uh, and uh, and Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate, which has a direct affiliation with Moscow Patriarch, who is the main ideological figure for this Russian ideology called Russian world. And he's the main spiritual advisor to President Putin. So this church in Ukraine, Ukraine Orthodox uh, Church of Moscow Patriarchat, is still in majority in Ukraine. When Ukraine is in a such, I mean, a war, a uh, battle, you know, so with uh, uh, Russia now. And the aim of this war to just have Ukraine, you know, be, be wiped off of the uh, face of the earth, you know, to distinct, I mean, to, to, uh, so to destroy it completely. So in this Russian uh, Orthodox Church, when affiliation with Ukrainian Orthodox of Moscow or Russian Patriarchate, they are still there representing Putin's arm of influence in Ukraine. Orthodox Church of uh, Ukraine that became independent or broke away from Russian Orthodox Church the first day they uh, announced independence back in 93, 94. Uh, so they, uh, uh, with the direct affiliation with the universal patriarch, they call it, received Thomas or a symbol of authority for independent uh, uh, service, you know, for them. So, and that's, uh, so this is, a Ukrainian Orthodox Church that most Ukrainians now regard as their national church. So the authorities in Ukraine, seen how war is going, in many cases, representatives of this church affiliated with Moscow, they even involved in persecution and atrocities, aiding the invaders on their territory. They came up with a policy. They say, we're not stopping anybody's uh, or we're not dictating, you know, on their spiritual or faith affiliation. We just want to create a policy. If you are in Ukrainian territory, if you are part of or a citizen of Ukraine, we would like to uh, kind of see your affiliation be cut off with an external influence. That's where some people, uh, and of course, Russia, you know, understanding if Ukraine cuts this affiliation uh, for them, you know, so uh, of their influence still on Ukrainian people, especially in Eastern territories of Ukraine. So that would will be a huge uh, defeat for them. So they hired, you know, paid lobbyists who go around the world now and use all possible channels of influence. I can name some of them, like uh, Tucker Carlson. He got caught in this uh, really being so off of the real situation, saying that Ukraine persecutes Christians. Ukraine is probably the most free country in Europe, if you can say, in terms of religious freedom and human rights. You know, the president is the Jew, openly Jew, secular Jew, as he calls him, or, you know, so that the the prime minister is a Muslim today, or, I mean, the secretary of uh, defense is a Muslim, you know, so although he's not devoted, as he says, but still he follows, you know, so their culture and so on. And every leader, you know, even evangelical community, you know, so they have a part to say. So they requested the president of Ukraine to do something to somehow bring their influence, to somehow limit the Russian affiliation in a time of war for Ukraine. So, and that's where Tucker Carlson, when he said that there is a persecution, religious persecution, it's totally off, so not true. But another thing, it just came uh, to light, so that this all comes 
from a paid, very influential lobbyist uh, so that are on this issue. They are hired by the Orthodox Church with Moscow Patriarch hat, you know, so to push this issue. So, I mean, ex especially through the media, so that there is uh, per religious persecution in Ukraine with one purpose, so that they, uh, Ukraine would not get, because of this issue, would not get economical help from the U.S. and other countries. So as I understand it, uh, Sergey and Dave and everyone, it, it's not a case that there, there's an objection to anyone of the Orthodox faith practicing that faith in Ukraine. It's the fact that the, the part of the Orthodox Church that really reports to Moscow and is under Moscow's control is not only existing in Ukraine, but is aiding Russia in its battle in Ukraine. That's, that's what's so troubling here. And that's the case. So, and uh, it's uh, Robert uh, Amsterdam. He's a Canadian, uh, but uh, who lives in London, you know, owns a large, I mean, a, a prominent international uh, lawyer. So that's who is pushing this issue now all around, even uh, uh, the states, you know, in Washington, trying to bring all that blame on Ukraine in general. People cannot say much because they are not educated, they're not informed, they don't know the truth. And this what, you know, so when we presented this Faith Under Fire report, started opening some lights, uh, I mean, eyes, you know, for some influential people, so that finally started getting more involved and religious uh, commission on international religious uh, freedom within the U.S. Senate, you know, so they are taking this very much into consideration. So this is battle is just behind the scene. That's what's happening. But there is still, and you ask Dave, that's a good question. So unfortunately, those lobbyists, you know, so that have a basically unlimited resources, influence, they take hostage our conservative fundamental uh, brothers, you know, their perception, understanding, because there is not in that there is no in depth more. Uh, you know, education available, you know, nobody reports on what's actually happening in Ukraine. But what's actually happening when Russia takes over a region, first of all, they eliminate all evangelical, any other faith group, but the Russian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchat. In this report, people can go and find this uh, online. It's actually on our front page now. So there are over 650 churches, church buildings being destroyed, over 70 pastors being intimidated, many got killed, and they continue this politics. They just want to uh, intimidate all the religious groups into submission. None, uh, any other church has a right to exist unless they submit and get re-registered under the Russian occupational authorities, uh, but Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate, that's the persecution. That's genocide of, if I can call it, religious and ethnic genocide against Ukrainians. And that's, nobody knows about this. And Robert Amsterdam, when he's attacking all these uh, initiatives that uh, Ukrainian government is trying to impose uh, just in a, within the realm, again, of uh, uh, religious freedom. Uh, so they're giving rights to all believers to believe where they just want to cut their political influence in their country that is connected to their enemy. And if Robert does this, he is just not serving the people of Ukraine, but he is employer who is in Moscow, in the Kremlin. So that's the issue, and we're going to go a little deeper even on that issue. When we come back in just a moment, we'll be joined by an attorney who has been at the forefront of this battle of uh, getting the story right. We'll talk with Lauren Homer coming up on The Public Square. of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Lauren Homer is an international religious freedom and human rights lawyer. She's president of the Law and Liberty Trust, 
and a board member of Mission Eurasia. Lauren, you wrote an article first on LinkedIn that said Ukraine will likely soon pass a law as a national security measure permitting closing Ukrainian religious organizations that operate as part of Russian religious organizations. But some people are seeing this move as a general curtailing of religious liberty in Ukraine. So what's going on here? Well, thanks so much for doing this interview, Wayne. Um, Ukraine has the best religious freedom regulatory climate among the various former Soviet republics. Uh, It has got over 35,000 different religious organizations registered of every type of Christian denomination, uh, Orthodox, uh, Jewish, uh, and Muslim, and many other smaller groups. But it is considering a law that would exclusively focus on organizations that have ties to religious centers, in other words, that get their direction and marching orders from religious organizations inside Russia, because it is an aggressor state, as it says in the uh, proposed law. That is, it's waging a full-scale war on Ukraine, as everyone is well aware. Uh, In practice, the Russian Orthodox Church is a key part of the Kremlin's propaganda and uh, civil society arm changing the views of Russians about the war in Ukraine and trying to justify it in the eyes of the world. They've taken an active role in in saying that this war is necessary in order to fulfill Russia's destiny as the center of what is called the Russian world. And they are blessing tanks and cannons and, uh, eradicating religious freedom in occupied parts of Ukraine. So this has become a national security issue for the government of Ukraine because the subsidiary of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, which um, is called the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and I add Moscow Patriarchate because it's under the thumb of the Moscow Patriarchate based in Moscow, Uh, has been engaged in a lot of activity that is actively undermining uh, democracy in Ukraine. Uh, Priests have been implicated in helping invading authorities find people to arrest, Mm. torture, and kill. Um, And uh, they've alerted Russians to um, sites for bombing that have resulted in many deaths. So this is a really active uh, anti-government action, and what what they're trying to do is get the Ukrainian Orthodox Church not to stop existing, but to stop working under um, the administration in Moscow. And if they won't, they'll close it down. Just to be clear, there are two kinds of Orthodox in Ukraine. There's the Orthodox that report to the patriarch in Ukraine and the Orthodox that report to Moscow. And so this law ostensibly would be aimed at those, those Orthodox churches that are, uh, they're taking their orders from Moscow, frankly, right? That's right. And yeah, there are actually nine different Orthodox denominations in Ukraine. But okay. The two major ones are the Ukrainian, um, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which is a free church, uh, which is granted independence by the ecumenical patriarch in Istanbul. This is part of an ancient structure that has existed, uh, from the early days of Christianity, that the patriarch in Istanbul is the de facto leader of orthodoxy in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the Ukraine church is under them. The Ukrainian Orthodox church is the holdover from Soviet times and Russian imperial times, which is under the direction of the patriarchate in Moscow. So the bottom line here is that the the proposed law in Ukraine is not 
uh, aimed at curtailing religious liberty in Ukraine, except for those churches that are taking their support and control and direction from Moscow, which is a, a security concern. That's that's the issue here, isn't it? That's right. And every other church in Ukraine uh, has complete freedom. Uh, and for that matter, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has complete freedom right now. Um, they're, they're in a battle, an internal battle with their members, many of whom don't want to be affiliated with Moscow and are voting to leave the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and join the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So people may have seen videos of clashes between clerics inside churches, but that's what that's about. It's about who's in charge in a particular congregation. Yeah. This is not the government of Ukraine. And by the way, we have many, many reports of how brutal it's been on churches in Ukraine that have been controlled by Russian troops. We we have uh, personal friends who have been held at gunpoint in their own churches. That kind of thing has gone on. That's been documented by Mission Eurasia. Um, so despite what we might hear in the American media, this is not aimed at curtailing religious liberty. That's a that's an important message for us to get across here. But there's a story behind this story, too, Lauren, and that is what and who is behind this disinformation campaign being uh, bought into by many in the U.S.? Yeah, well, that's the, the great, probably the biggest concern that I have is that Russia has been running for years what they call disinformation campaigns inside the United States. They have found if they tell enough people lies, some will believe them. So in the case of of this uh, dispute about who's going to be in charge of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Ukrainians or Russians, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has hired a lawyer based in London named Robert Amsterdam, as a lobbyist who has been working with Tucker Carlson and other uh, U.S. spokespeople to try to convince Americans that Ukraine is bad on religious freedom. But as you said, nobody's challenging the freedom of religion of members of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. They're challenging the fact that they're taking their direction from Moscow. And um, Ukraine actually allows unregistered religious activities. So nothing will happen to their worship services. They can have their religious holidays whatever day they want them. Um, The only thing is they will not be able to continue to operate if they are directed by Moscow. And uh, it's a concern of yours about Mr. Amsterdam because he has, uh, well, he's attacked you personally, hasn't he? Yes, he has. He has, um, he's been spreading a lot of lies. And when I found out about it a couple of months ago, I wrote the article that you just referred to. And I've got um, another one also posted on, on my LinkedIn uh, page as as articles where I demolish his arguments, and this made him very angry. So he was accusing me of not being a professional, of spreading lies. And so, of course, I found that rather irritating since I've been working in this field for 34 years. And as far as I can figure out, he's been involved for about six months. Mm -hmm. And is he a registered lobbyist in the U.S.? No, that's a real problem. And as the Wall Street Journal and others have pointed out, he is not registered to lobby for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And yet he has been writing letters to the uh, Ukrainian Rada, that's their parliament, uh, threatening individual members, every individual member, with U.S. sanctions if they pass this proposed law. So how he, a Canadian living in London, is going to get U.S. sanctions imposed without lobbying in the United States is a great mystery. Of course he's lobbying in the United States, and his lobbying is tragically having an impact on the views of a lot of American Christians who are telling their congressmen and senators not to vote for funding for Ukraine because they believe these lies. 
Lauren, thanks for your work on this issue. I know it's been uh, hard and we really appreciate it. We're going to keep tracking with the, uh, the concern and uh, keep in touch with you. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks so much for having me, Wayne. Well, you are listening to The Public Square, and we'll continue this topic again with Sergey Rakuba coming up in our next segment. We are online. If you joined us late, listen to the program online or with our smartphone app, The Public Square. Online, thepublicsquare.com. Back with you on The Public Square today with Sergey Rakuba, president of Mission Eurasia. And Sergey, uh, Lauren mentioned Robert Amsterdam, and you mentioned him earlier, of course. Uh, tell me about his uh, trying to convince the Ukrainian parliament not to pass this this religious liberty law aimed at the Orthodox Church from Moscow. Okay, uh, Wayne, as I know from my contacts in the Ukrainian government, and I'm talking about people that oversee this procedure, you know, within the Ukrainian parliament, you know, considering this law very carefully, you know, with my connection with the ombudsman, uh, Dmitry Lubinets, who represents uh, the president of Ukraine into Ukrainian uh, parliament, but also uh, Mr. Viktor Yelensky, who is the highest uh, ranking official within the Ukrainian government overseeing all religious affairs. Victor just informed me that uh, uh, Robert uh, 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 Amsterdam, he was just recently in Kyiv. He stayed, you know, so with the, uh, the uh, Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarch had, you know, used their transportation, all the contacts, you know, so basically, you know, working well, uh, uh, you know, so for his employer. So, yes, he does push this issue if Ukraine uh, uh, pushes the, or signs this bill and if they will reinforce or enforce the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarch uh, to cut their affiliation with the center of influence. This is not to shut them down. This is not to limit mm -hmm. them of their worship or their liturgy or so on, but just to limit their or cut their affiliation with Moscow. So then uh, Ukraine will experience huge sanctions, he promises, on behalf of U.S. somehow. U.S. should impose sanctions for Ukraine because there is no religious freedom and other countries. And so that's what he's pushing, pushing uh, around. And when Ukraine, this is such an important way, and I apologize if I, uh, it, extremely important this uh, now when uh, U.S. Congress is considering that uh, $60 billion aid package to enable Ukraine to fight for their freedom, independence, their sovereignty, and push the invader back out of their territories. Robert is not working for that. Mm -hmm. He's working for his employer, mm -hmm. who is part of that invasion, huge uh, propaganda strategy, trying to stop this aid. And this is all what about. So we don't need, Dave, we don't need Moscow telling the U.S. Congress how to vote on this issue. This is a very difficult and troubling subject. Let's let's take a couple of minutes and talk with the panel about this. Clearly, uh, Putin and his team understand American weaknesses. Americans don't like long wars. We have a feeling in America that no war lasts more than 48 months. It's just part of our DNA. It's a part of our history. Um, and it's particularly part of our modern history. In addition to that, uh, there have been a lot of people who have been trying to uh, convince everyone that we're going to be caught in a quagmire. Uh, and so they bring up all kinds of illustrations. We have forgotten the fundamental reality that the biggest mistake that the Ukrainian people made was to geographically be on Putin's front porch and then to prove that independence works. And that's a real problem for him. And so. Putin makes, takes his actions and dares the world to stop him. In addition to that, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. And so Putin knows he can push that button as well and, and, and push and push and push. But here's one other reality. There's no way that Ukraine is going to overcome the Soviet Union in, 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 in battle unless they outsurvive the Soviet resolve to extinguish a free Ukraine. So that means this is going to take a while. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that Putin has lobbyists trying to create uh, ghost stories, fabrications, 
to make the United States Congress suddenly run away in an election year. What's sad is that a number of conservatives can't see through this. And I, I don't, I, I think what's the problem is, is that they're not getting the word from the ground. I saw a, a piece called The Putin System, a documentary a year or so ago. And part of that documentary described the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, the, the Moscow Patriarchate. And that man was a uh, part of the KGB for 40 years, um, at least as it was reported in this documentary. So I, I think when Americans hear the church is being persecuted, they th equate that to what our church experience is, but really the, it's the believers and other denominations that are not a part of the Moscow Patriarchate that are they're the ones that are being persecuted, and the and the Moscow Patriarchate is involved in pushing. Because because I'm reading in the uh, report, the Faith Under Fire report, which I believe we need to post on our after show notes so pe everyone can see this. They're describing um, churches and anything that's involved in a religious minority, and which would include the Evangelical Church in Ukraine, is being. Um, the soldiers are starting to raid prayer houses during church services. Uh, repressions are occurring directed against churches of all denominations except the Moscow Patriarchate hmm. affiliated uh, Orthodox you know, denomination. So this whole persecution is coming from those who are trying to confuse the American people. And, and is, am I off base there? Is this, is that? A summary of what you've been describing? Yeah, that's exactly what's what's happening there, you know. So, and that report is literally been dated, uh, because since you know, so that report was published, you know, there are a lot more, uh, you know, persecutions, oppressions uh, on religious groups. You know, it's even happening. It's escalated. Uh, you know, people being in prison. You know, just that's the latest story. A young girl from the church, Baptist church in. Uh, uh, Mariupol, which is not too far from my hometown in Zaporozhye. Uh, so she just posted on her Facebook or sent a private message. So just kind of referring, please pray for us. We're here under pressure. Next day she was arrested. Mm -hmm. She is in prison now in Russia. Exactly. Again, think, you know, so from Militopol, which is temporary occupied, she is in Russia now accused of collaborating with the enemy. Who is the enemy? U.S. not collaborating even with Ukraine, collaborating with the enemy U.S. So she was uh, in jail. I mean, sent to jail for four years. This is one of many stories. That's what's happening now in the occupied territories. So to me, to me, that means that the the Orthodox Church, um, the Moscow Patriarchate, is the wolf in sheep's clothing. Fifth column. That yeah, and that's what that's what's happening. Yeah. So it's no wonder that the Ukrainian government is concerned about that and is considering this law to uh, to cut off that influence of Moscow uh, through the Orthodox Church. Uh, Sergey, take just one minute, if you can, and describe what happened in Michael Britson's church. Yeah, Michael Britson, that's one of the author, I mean, the principal author of that Faith Under Fire report, has a tremendous personal story when the, the Russian troops just came, and Militopol, by the way, is just miles away from that nuclear power station that uh, Russia really wanted to take over from the first few days of uh, the war. Uh, so he decided to stay with his congregation. Lots of people were taking refuge, you know, moving out, um, uh, traveling to more safer places. He stayed with his congregation. You know, I'm skipping a few months, and one, he was congregating, you know, he was bringing uh, all pastors, you know, who decided to stay under occupation and care for their for their congregations. So uh, he was calling them on to daily prayers. He says once, you know, so the KGB officer, you know, with all, you know, so his entourage and so on, they came, say, no, you're not meeting anymore. But then next day on Sunday, on Sunday morning, so the uh, Russian soldiers, you know, so with again under gunpoint, 
break into their uh, Sunday morning worship service. Now, very few people stayed there, but it's even caught on video. And under the gunpoint, they arrest the pastor, Michael, take him into detention, interrogate it, you know, intimidate it. And then, you know, so they deported him out of that occupational territories to Ukraine. Church was shut down, so the cross was uh, 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 taken off. So they put a Russian symbol on it, repurposed the building, and now that evangelical Christian Baptist church building is used as the headquarters for the Russian authorities uh, here in uh, Militopol. And that's just one of hundreds of stories like that. Mm -hmm. We'll be back on The Public Square of the final segment. You stay with us if you can. If not, listen online at thepublicsquare.com. We'll be right back for more on The Public Square. Our guest on The Public Square today is Sergei Rakuba of Mission Eurasia, and we have referred to that report called Faith Under Fire. It will be in our program notes. It's on the Mission Eurasia website as well. Faith Under Fire, Navigating Religious Freedom Amidst the War in Ukraine. Actually, what's online is even uh, updated over the print version, I think, that I have. Is that right, Sergei? There have been additional uh, items added to it. So look for that in our program notes, Faith Under Fire. All right, uh, Jeff, you've been uh, waiting to ask a question. Yeah, um, I am not a military expert by far, and I don't know if Sergei is either, but uh, it seems to me that Ukraine is running out of two things. It's running out of manpower, and it's running out of munitions, particularly artillery shells. This this was going to be a lightning war by Russia, but it, it has turned into a trench warfare governed by the use of heavy artillery. And the Russians are able to fire about 10,000 shells every day, and they have plenty to spare. They're buying their artillery shells from North Korea and from maybe some other places. And Ukraine has to be very careful about their artillery. They, they can fire maybe 3,000 a day. And, of course, they're running out of manpower. Um, so my question is, how long do you think Ukraine can hold out at this point? And then secondly, because I know that they are sinking, they're still sinking Russian ships and taking down Russian airplanes. That's interesting. But also, if this American aid package that is in the U.S. House right now, if that is passed, do you think that that will, that will enable Ukraine to then continue on and be victorious to some degree? What, what do you think? I know that's a lot of questions. I'm sorry. It's a good question, you know, it's a deep question, you know, so, and that's, as my good friend Wayne says, you know, Sergey tried to do it in one minute, you know, for a Ukrainian. <laughs> I know, I, 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 I know, I, I'll give up on that, Sergey. but God bless you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just to say, say greetings, you know, so, uh, but it's an excellent question, you know, Jeff. So uh, Ukraine has such a high level of resilience, you know, so they will be fighting to the end. You see that they went over the, over the point, you know, so that giving up now, it means just to give up their existence. Mm -hmm. So this is the, 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 not just the war, you know, for something. This is for their existence. So and if Russia takes over, they understand what's happening in occupational, those territories Russia temporarily occupies will happen across the nation. And it won't stop there, Sergey. It'll go on to other parts of the former Soviet Russian Empire, right? The next can be, and I can name you, Baltic countries, you know, Moldova, uh, Poland, etc. You know, but that's, and that's, uh, Ukrainians will be fighting, you know, to its end. They do have munition. They don't have enough support. Uh, so the support we send or other countries, you know, we send, we support them to the point, this is kind of so known, uh, not to lose the war. Mm -hmm. They need a little more support to take victorious steps and they have they will mobilize the manpower they have that emotional that spiritual if i can say they have the spirit for victory because they are fighting against the invader uh, and so and that's what if we help the army and remove all the limitations 
just one one little nuance. Last week, U.S. government advised Ukrainians not to target Russian refineries in Russia. Huh. Ukrainians learn how to do making their own drones that reach to those places and bring damage not similar to like what your Russian powerful missiles do to the Ukrainian refineries, but at least, you know, to uh, take a little bite, if I can say. <laughs> so the U.S. government advises Ukraine not to do this because this can somehow, you know, so, uh, I don't know, do something, you know, in the terms of, you know, the bigger picture. <laughs> if Ukraine gets munition, if Ukraine gets longer range missiles, this war can come to the end a lot sooner. And that's unfortunately, you know, so somehow, and who is that someone who does not allow Ukraine to take the victorious steps against Russia? Sergey, that leads me to my question. I, it seems to me one of the reasons that American conservatives are susceptible to the type of disinformation that we've been discussing today is because we currently have a lot of distrust, at least I do, for our mainstream media, and we have a lot of distrust for our current administration. And so there's this there's this sense that do those in charge in America and, and allied countries even want this war to be over soon? Hmm. You know, so why would, like you yeah. said, why would they tell them not to strategically target places? We have a lot of distrust for the people that are giving us information and leading this country. At least I do. And I think a lot of other conservatives do as well. So that's Amen. one of the reasons that it's hard to parse out. So we don't know what a victory looks like. Like what does a Ukrainian victory look like? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there is, um, you know, a lot of information hidden from the public uh, knowledge and uh, so on. So, but uh, uh, I don't know why. And the Ukrainians are wondering why, you know, so this help is delayed, you know. So if we had a victorious moment, they started pushing Russian troops out of regions like Kherson, Kharkov, even the first few months of the war, you know, so soon they got the better, better weapons, you know, so, and uh, so that nobody wanted to build on that momentum, you know, so that the Ukrainian army exhausted again. So they uh, ran out of munition, they had to retrieve. And I don't know, you know, if we can help and the European, some European countries are quite determined, uh, but uh, I don't know why the military help is not reaching Ukraine, and especially here in the States. Uh, you know, so I think if we make the decision to end this war, we can do it at once, you know, just equip Ukraine with the right weapons. They do have the spirit for the victory. This war can come to the end a lot sooner. Dave and panel, I, I think uh, for me, it's a matter of uh, pay me now or pay me later, because I feel like if mm -hmm. Putin endures in Ukraine, that's only the beginning of his uh, ambition uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that's a that's a real issue. And I remind everyone that during the Clinton administration, we persuaded Ukraine to give up its nuclear weapons and told mm -hmm. Ukraine that we would support them. So that's uh, there's more of the facts behind this story, Dave. Wayne, there's so much more to talk about, and we're going to carry this on into an overtime conversation that will become a TPS Express program and a part of our daily 30-minute broadcast on stations around the country. Uh, and to be fair with the time we have left, it's going to take more conversation. We're going to let Sergey go, but we're going to go ahead and talk amongst ourselves here okay. and, and continue the conversation. But what I want to do is I want to encourage everyone, if, if you could get this report, Faith Under Fire, it's only a few months old and it's already been updated. It is filled with a, a perspective of integrity and honesty from the ground. If you would send that to everyone you know who's talking with you about Ukraine, if you would send it in an email to your members of Congress, if you'd follow up and make a phone call to those members' offices and ask, has my congressperson seen this report? If you could let there be a groundswell of interest and information, it would help everyone dramatically. We're talking about one of the biggest bullies in the world with a history of murder, taking on people to clear their front porch solely for their power advantage. And Americans don't tolerate bullies very well. We need to stand up for people who are dying for no good reason than they were born in the wrong place. That's called genocide. And that's not right. Yeah. And so we need to do something about this. The cause hasn't changed. And I also want to thank everyone um, uh, connected to the public square who's given contributions 
to this wonderful charity, Mission Eurasia, that's trying to do the right thing the right way. And Wayne, again, I thank, I couldn't thank you enough to Sergey and to you for what you're doing. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Pray for our leaders here in the States so that they have a more deeper understanding, maybe responsibility. If we can say when we're helping those who suffer and they're trying to defend their freedom, you know, to the end, we need to help them to defend themselves. Pray for for Ukrainian leaders, but pray for the Ukrainian church in the midst of this destruction. This church, the I mean, flourishing, you know, from the ashes of this war, hmm. uh, bringing the gospel to people that need hope, they need salvation in Jesus. There's an untold story here, and we're trying to tell it. Thank you, Sergey, and thank you for listening to the Public Square. Thanks for your support. We'll see you next time. The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.